Hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and to host this wonderful panelist. Uh, thank you for joining us and giving me this honor. Uh, to E4M for bringing back the Bangalore edition of Pitch CMO. Um, it's always great to have events in Bangalore and bring together some uh, wonderful minds and uh, personalities in one room. Uh, and to my lovely audience, without you we wouldn't be complete, so thank you for being here and listening in on uh, our discussions. Um, so as, as I said, today we're uh, diving into um, a very um, intriguing uh, con uh, topic and uh, talking about designing for mobile first strategies for the modern consumer. Uh, that in itself has so much meaning in it, so uh, as I launch into it, I'd like to define a few things and then we get down to business. So, um, in a world that's now led by the most accessible screen, which is the mobile, and the large landscape that it is, um, characteristics, preferences, and um, expectations of this modern consumer uh, allows for and should be spoken about. Uh, most importantly, uh, how are we as marketeers, uh, as media folk, and as publishers approaching this, and how important is this medium to us? Um, so just like I mentioned, defining this, uh, the consumers who are born in the period when internet became widely available and are highly adapted to the use of internet in their decision making for buying goods and services. This is the search result for a modern consumer. I think we can all agree that's the most simplest and very well defined search result. Um, so today, taking this dive into it, um, about the expectations of the modern consumer, uh, and to ask the most important question, is the modern consumer essentially a mobile consumer and how are we engaging this? Um, to just understand the landscape of the tele telecom or the mobile uh, world that we're living in, um, try, as per try, there are 1.14 billion telecom subscribers. So that's just setting the stage of scale and opportunity so let me open this up now. So my first question is to all my panelists, so we'll go around in turn for a quick round. What would this mean to you to be in a mobile first world and to design mobile first strategies in a world where consumers interact with multiple channels? You can go around the table. Okay. Thanks, Altia. Good to see you here. Um, so you said two things, one is a modern consumer, another is mobile first, right? So these two, you know, words itself are so interconnected. Uh, when you say modern consumer, you also assume that they are <coughs> younger audience, right? So what does mobile first truly mean, right? We all know, everybody talks about mobile strategies, but, uh, you know, if you ask me, it is as simple as your consumers, um, you know, looking, seeking information, interacting, communicating, everything on mobile, right? If you also look at the digital ecosystem right now, 90%, you know, consumption is on mobile, right? The content consumption, 90% is on mobile. When you run campaigns, your 90% of impressions are served, you know, on, you know, mobile device, right? Which means, um, unlike your, uh, you know, 30 plus audiences or your millennials, right, who also have a hybrid behavior, the younger audience do not look at any other device, which means your content, your strategies, everything need to be done, um, you know, keeping mobile uh, first kind of a, you know, approach in mind. We all know this, but are we really doing this? Not, no, I mean, I, I belong to an agency, therefore I'm exposed to a variety of brands, you know, the evergreen FMCG brands to your, uh, you know, technology brands. And so if you look at the kind of uh, work that's been across, the intent is there, but I, and I think brands also know how to approach that. But if it is being done full-fledgedly, no, right? You still have scenarios where a TVC is shot, right? And that's run on YouTube or, um, you know, on social platforms, that's not how it's going to work going forward, right? You really need to understand what kind of content your consumers are, um, you know, looking at their for data is very important, analytics is very important. You need to have digital first assets to be created. Now, there's a lot of research, data, 
that is required. I mean, digital allows you to do a lot of A-B testing as well. So my plea always to brands is, uh, you know, don't just, you know, replicate your TV strategies on digital because if your target, yes, I mean, I'm not saying it's a, it's a, you know, kind of a blanket statement. If your consumer still is 35 plus, which is still okay, they are both on TV, largely on TV, and they're actually getting used to, you know, digital consumption, but the younger audiences are not. They're not on television. So why are you creating assets where your consumers are not, right? It is just for your own feel good. Therefore, the entire thought in terms of what mobile first really means, what are your consumers doing, and therefore slicing and dicing that, uh, you know, that entire asset into various fit to format, you know, understanding, you know, the ecosystem better, understanding what they're consuming, how they're consuming, you know, context, the environment in which you are in, right, all that is really important. I think we all know about it, but are brands and agencies really, you know, walking that path? I think it's a long way to go. Yeah, just to um, sort of continue from where uh, Aparna left off, I think that um, especially as marketers, right, uh, over the years um, before this whole advent of mobile marketing and mobile first, uh, a mobile first approach, there used to be the law of averages, right, where you had a consumption TG and you had a communication TG and you would design your comms in a certain way, <coughs> keeping in mind the communication TG, but not necessarily the consumption TG, right? I think now with uh, <coughs> the advent of the mobile phone and internet penetration and all of that, uh, we have come to a place where it is a, where we need to start deaveraging things. What I mean by this is that uh, whether it is uh, the kind of content that we create, whether it is what we optimize our campaigns for, right? Uh, earlier on, the campaign optimization pretty much used to be, are you getting a good top of mind? Are you getting good awareness? Is there good consideration, intent to purchase, so on and so forth? But now, as the, you know, the, the line between performance and brand marketing is slowly sort of getting eliminated, uh, you optimize on performance for in-app actions, right? Uh, and similarly on brand as well, you cannot shy away anymore from the fact that you need that consumer to do something on the mobile phone, which is an immediate sort of a reaction to what you are putting out there. So I think that the lag time between uh, doing something to reach out to the consumer versus the consumer actually reacting to that and doing something on your platform, that lag time has significantly reduced. and. Uh, Brands need to understand that uh, a mobile first approach uh, would also mean that you have multiple uh, you know, ways to reach out to the consumer on performance, which is, whether it's SMS, WhatsApp, push notifications, etc. Right? But brand typically used to stay away from that, right? because you used to want to build a story around it, build a narrative around it. It just needs to have a lot more call to action, especially because there is no lag time anymore between you serving something to the consumer and you understanding how well it is doing. You don't have to wait that one, two months for you to get that lag effect or whatever you've spoken about. So, so yeah, I think de-averaging for me would be one big thing that uh, at least as a brand marketer, I'm something, uh, I'm, I'm working on that and I would advise people to sort of look into that as, a, uh, as part of their mobile first strategy. Hi, thank you for having me in the show. Um, see, look at the look at what's happening in the Indian market. Um, today we talk about 1.2 billion mobile devices, out of which about 800 million are smartphones. Every year we sell about 150 million smartphones in the country. This is excluding the second-hand smartphones which are really catching up in the market. So that presents every brand, every uh, marketer, millions of opportunity every day. Uh, now let's boil into the coming down to the brand level. <coughs> For a category like auto, which is in a high involvement category, uh, and the replacement cycles anyway between eight to ten years, are uh, you looking at a constant uh, period of looking at what product should I buy? Right. So therefore, my consideration cycle is not just like an FMCG brand where I'm looking at 15 days or 20 days. Uh, you need to be at the uh, you need to have at the top of mind brand salience. While auto brands need to do that. The challenge that we face is that how do you keep the consumer engaged for such a long time? Right? Therefore, my mid-funnel, which is the consideration funnel, I call it as 
constant cycle of consideration, uh, needs to be uh, evolving every time. Right? And as a brand, I need to appeal to that audience in the right way, addressing his barriers, concerns, and driving the aspiration towards a brand. It's a continual process for me. While I say this, the topic of this discussion is mobile first, but I say I would say consumer first. As Aparna said, lots many little suggest on the mobile phones. Nobody is looking at the TV. But it also depends on the kind of brand uh, that you are. For example, say an auto category for a scooter category that I come from. Probably all my consumers fall between 25 to 34. Right? And therefore, TV forms an important uh, media for me to drive the funnel. But once you get that awareness to a certain extent, I wouldn't go over investing on those medias and probably I look at what are my consideration drivers and then invest there. And mobile probably is a gateway to me, gateway to whatever experience you're having around the world, across platforms, across screens, whatever you take. And that, that becomes very, very important when you're looking at a time frame for one year of consideration. Well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Tia and Exchange for me for hosting this. Um, it's a very interesting topic for me and uh, uh, I was with Swiggy before and uh, uh, now I'm with a B2B with Razor Pay. It was a very different story for me and back in Swiggy about when I joined I remember at 2015 it was around 40% of orders were mobile and it rose up to 90-95% each in a an year and it was always more and then it was mobile. right? So every the, the default way of me thinking is Anything to do with the device is always mobile. Uh, be it conversion optimization, choosing channels, distributing content, everything was formed around mobile and is very, very focused on mobile. But it took a very U turn for me when I moved to Race Appear. It is this, this long held belief that B2B always get uh, 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 spend time on desktop versus mobile. Right? Uh, but how we at Race Appear look at things is uh, look at the preference of users from a device perspective look at their stages, needs, uh, and craft those strategies, right? For example, what we have seen is uh, 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 small especially businesses, merchants who look at evaluating certain uh, solutions, uh, start from educating themselves about a payment gateway or uh, reading through a particular report, etc. are being heavily consumed on mobile versus when they want to take an action where uh, uploading a document or doing a KYC verifications are we prefer to do on a desktop, right? So I think it is important to understand the uh, different users, what's their different stages, needs, and try to craft that uh, strategy accordingly versus only looking at, obviously there is, I mean again, I'm not saying mobile versus desktop, be it the channel, be it WhatsApp, be it Facebook or LinkedIn, whichever the channels that you are reaching out to, I think it is important to understand what stages are there and what kind of users we are talking to accordingly place their uh, and help them to uh, have that right experience is what uh, uh, I think I think mobile strategy means to me. Yeah. device to actually you know consistently share different messaging right they're very consistent from social media to their app to you know any other asset and the kind of messages they craft, right, uh, looking at the context of the consumer, I think it makes you feel go back. I think one of the great examples of how, you know, a brand like Swiggy has been leveraging this device, right? So that was a quick note on Swiggy. I think a lot of people are having some good experiences with the brand. They have their messaging that is targeted to me, right? They know when I'm hungry, they know when I've ordered last time, and that's what I was thinking about data analytics. And the way they craft their message, It's come from like uh, around 10,000 sets of test and control experiments. Yeah, we Absolutely, 100 percentage degree. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here, Tia, and Exchange for Media. So, I will articulate my uh, response in two halves, uh, and I'll build on to what all the other uh, folks have spoken about. So. The way I, when we think about mobile first, the way I would think about it is that we, we can talk about experience part of it as in how should your experience or how the experience of the consumer should be uh, when you're thinking mobile first and ultimately how does it tie back to your growth because all of us think about growth, brief growth all the time. So, you know, and I'm 
uh, and I'm going tactical here. Uh, so one of the things uh, from our understanding and our learning has been that when you are thinking mobile first, you are handshakes between various devices and within the devices on website and app has to be very seamless, right? If you do not do a good job with it, the experience breaks and the consumer has to do the entire journey all over again and and that hampers the consumer experience. So what Swiggy does very well is to, uh, uh, just to you know, build on that other example that we just spoke about, I think they, their handshakes are very good. I think their whole, I mean, there are, there are four or five businesses that they are running internally, but all of them come together and for consumer it just feels like one similar habit, right? So that's one. I think another is that we touched up briefly upon the content part of it again, but I think your messaging, your value proposition, uh, whatever, for the various segments of customer that you're targeting has to be consistent across your various touch points in the mobile first world because consumer may interact with you on website, on mobile, they may also see some messages on the ground, etc. and all, but how do you narrate that? How do you stitch all of it together so that you're building a cohesive story for them is another important part of the experience piece. Uh, the third is that, I mean, how are you optimizing your uh, mobile flows? Uh, because a lot of flows which used to work on the website may not necessarily work on the mobile. So uh, when we are designing things that go to be always thinking mobile heavy because of course 99% of our business now comes through mobile. So we build mobile first and then if have to extend, we extend it to the website. So that's very important. And the fourth is that, I mean, this is now a little bit over abuse term in the last few months, but how do we use ML, etc., to make the life of the consumer pretty easy? So we're using some interesting techniques tactics which you'll see in the coming months at quarter to use the device that is there in your hand to let's say capture a photograph because logistics is a complex piece depending on what kind of goods you're moving from we move from envelope to elephant is what we call internally and depending on what goods you're moving the variety of inputs vary where you want to drop etc etc so how you use all of that to uh, using the mobile device to make the booking experience seamless is another important thing. And very briefly touching upon the growth, of course all of, if you do all of these things right, they add to the growth part of it. But specifically on the growth, I think when you're thinking mobile first, from the performance point of view, you're, you should have granular data on your events so that you're able to optimize your um, ads are, and are able to extract the maximum ROI. And the, and the last but not the, I mean, and, and we, uh, started investing a lot on it quarter is how do you really a b test uh, almost all the flows etc i mean all the small big changes etc uh, that you thought may not make uh, any difference in the life of the consumer also makes a lot of difference so and what i believe is that you don't really know from day one what does the consumer need it's only those incremental improvements one after another is what entirely adds up so those A-B testing abilities on the transactional flow, right from the sign of transaction flow, is extremely important to drive the growth. These are the things I feel are important when thinking mobile first. Just to add to a point what he said, um, uh, about eight to 10 years back when the mobile phone was catching up, smartphones, uh, there was a hypothesis saying that uh, on mobile phone, high value trans transactions cannot happen. Examples that people would not buy uh, products above rupees 10,000. Right. There was a hypothesis being formed saying that nobody buys uh, uh, things on mobile phone. There's obviously one was a transaction, but fundamentally what was happening was that people were not able to have a kind of experience that they want to have, to know about the product and buy it, right? And therefore, there were a lot of drop-offs and people were saying more conversions on desktop rather than mobile phone. Now it's completely inverse. Probably 90% of the uh, purchase happens in the mobile phone. Uh, firstly, thank you uh, for having me here. So, um, I mean, taking some of the discussion a little regional, um, see, uh, I think, uh, you know, most of you might not have heard about brand. Uh, we are a OTT brand, uh, operates, you know, with promise of 100% local entertainment for Telugu and Tamil. Uh, so, started in 2020, <coughs> and uh, we are uh, pretty much the number one OTT app in Telugu right now, uh, being promoted by, uh, you know, uh, family of Allu Arjun, some of you know, and my home group was a you know, big uh, construction company in Hyderabad. 
So, um, I mean, for me, in fact, uh, OTT itself is an experience on mobile. I mean, you know, entertainment today has been consumed the most on mobile. Our data shows that, you know, 70% of our consumption happens on mobile. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, taking that data further, we have about 80 million internet users in Telugu. Uh, thanks to data revolution that has happened. Everybody has internet access with limited data and etc. Uh, for me, everything happens on mobile because, you know, the content delivery is on mobile. I mean, while I'm not ignoring the experiences that has to be translated from a small screen to bigger screens like TVs and living rooms, but mobile still is the most important, uh, you know, device for me uh, because that is where you are, you know, the frequency of people using mobile in a day is, is huge, you know, at least 50, 60 times a day you pick up your phone and the people are spending four and a half hours plus on mobile each day. Uh, while this is happening, you are fight, you know, as a brand, we are actually fighting for the same four and a half hours of time. So that has to lead to making customized strategies because, uh, you know, the attention spans are less of how do you make sure that user experience is amazing on the phone uh, and how you are making sure that the purchase decision is happening faster. Uh, thanks to you know mobile, even purchase decisions are mostly happening on mobile, right? A quick, you know, as how much, how soon can you make the purchase decision happen on the mobile? From you know intention to subscribe to make a purchase decision, how you can you have to reduce the number of steps that takes to make a purchase decision as well. So uh, likewise in the product, this thing also uh, is that over a period of time. I mean, if you have noticed, if, you, if some of us you know um, no, notice this as well that the content consumption has moved from horizontal to vertical. Like, you know, people are scrolling up. So that is also giving us a lot of, you know, insights into what kind of a content we have to develop and what kind of a experiences we have to give. Uh, for example, we at AHA, apart from the shows and everything that we have, uh, we, we have introduced short form content on the app so that, you know, you know, somebody is not watching the content, but you want to retain them for longer time. and. You know, you give them short form content alongside we also stream live channels on mobile so that their reason to go out of your app is, is getting, you know, reduced. So that's why we are retaining most of them, you know, that's why we are, you know, uh, strategizing uh, mobile as a prime uh, device to, you know, uh, consider. Great. Thank you. I think we picked our panelists really well. Um, everyone's mobile first, but some key takeaways, I think, about statements about how you should be creative, communication, um, and adapting to what is at hand. Uh, I think that is more important. And I think we're all thinking it, but action speaks louder. Um, so good luck with all of that. Uh, but yes, um, diving into a few points now uh, of what we've touched on. Uh, and to be fair, uh, I think there's a lot uh, to be talked about, but uh, we pick a few. Um, so as a publisher, we've noticed uh, users' patterns uh, and how they create certain opportunities for us to help them utilize their time better, um, you know, fulfill their needs and be safe in this interaction. Uh, for example, we have seen like how an IPL, especially on the weekend, we've seen a 42% surge uh, in call engagements with uh, restaurants, pubs, F&B services. Um, we've also seen booking apps go up by about 59% on match uh, days or the weekends in the evening because people are either catching up with friends or they're going out to a pub to watch the match. Um, this is reading behavioral patterns. Uh, so my question is for you, Rajshekar. Uh, being in the space of content and entertainment, uh, picking up on all these behavioral ways uh, would be key to your business. Uh, mobile usage uh, could be primary to um, in, uh, a primary means to engage and understand these behavior patterns. So, with this in mind, what have been your experiences with the Im with the impact of mobile usage on consumer behavior? Sure. Um, so I'll take our business as an example for this. So um, uh, for us to watch a content or a movie piece, right, you need a lot of internet uh, data on your device. And uh, because most of the users are on mobile with, you know, uh, probably data limits of one to two GB per day, uh, except for the people who has, you know, privilege of Wi-Fi's and larger broadbands. So the limitation of data has become a important part in delivering the right experience. Because uh, what we, what is, you know, for us as a task is that 
see how can I deliver a full experience within 1GB data has become an extremely critical part. I mean, we, we, we take our data seriously, so we do our consumer research regularly. So the most frequently, uh, you know, uh, being talked about issue is that that data consumption. So what we what we have done is that you know over a period of time, uh, we have perfected our content deliveries and video encoding texts and all that. So today. Uh, we we are able to tell you know give an experience of two and a half hours within one GB of data. So uh, such things have uh, you know really been helpful because you know you want to give full experience. You know you don't can't uh, you know let customer you know craving for more content at the interval of a movie. So it doesn't really uh, fulfill the experience. So such things happen. Uh, the other thing is that uh, I mean early adapters for OTT has been 18 to 35 uh, age and uh, for us. Now the task is to build a category and the category building will happen you know when we move from urban to tier 2 and tier 3 and that also requires uh, going more vernacular. When I say that uh, you know the language and the you know language of navigation on the app you know you will you'll be uh, you know you know interested to know that we have a we have Telugu as a language navigation app uh, you know uh, uh, navigation in the app not just Telugu but also Tamil and also uh, when you open the app of AHA, you don't see content that is in Tamil for a Telugu user interface. We built custom uh, interfaces so that your, your user is not confused. I mean, particularly keeping in mind the behaviors of tier 2, tier 3 audience who wants easy access, simple experiences and all that, that is also there. So uh, also over a period of time, you know, now, like I said, urban to rural um, shift is happening. So now the price consciousness, you know, coming to picture, uh, willingness to pay as coming to picture, uh, you know, cutting cable cord as coming to picture. So with considering all this, what we also uh, has done is that we have been consistently, you know, bringing up price points which are mobile centric, like, you know, mobile only packs so that you encourage mobile usage, this is the experience and, you know, behaviors of the consumers in the past. So uh, such things also uh, has been happening. Great, thank you. I think Kaha is doing a fantastic job with getting regional, uh, using languages like you just mentioned in the most uh, um, productive way to kind of get that engagement going. But definitely listening to your user set. So we're looking forward to more from the brand. Um, and thank you for that. Um, Pranesh, um, moving from a tech to a tech plus auto world now, um, I, 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 I can imagine would bring a lot of interesting learnings. Um, it would also have you be uh, creative um, in terms of educating, talking about or building on your brand and also talking to co your consumer set to bring them on board. So as a brand through caller has never had a problem with scale, we are, you know, running second after meta. Uh, but more importantly for us, knowing our users, uh, uh, trust us, they come on board for a purpose and, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, Building a certain respect with that is where the growth is. Um, so my question to you is, how have you built on trust, handled inquiries, and used mobile strategies to build your brand story on mobile? Thank you. Um, I'll break my response into three, four categories. One is uh, obviously the trust. Uh, we are in a very new category where there are a lot many brands we have been in the country for decades or together. Uh, and there were, there's also a brand in the category which, were, which was in other categories, right? for example, say right tax. Right? So we never had the awareness and before, you, you can't build trust without awareness. Uh, so for us, it, an interesting fact that I want to share is, uh, we put out our first product in the market in 2018. Right? But our, we had a community from 2015 onwards. Right? Uh, so we co-built the product uh, in India, and we built and we take up the quality to such a notch, people have people don't believe that we are an Indian brand. Uh, so, community has played a large role in terms of what we have done so far and what we currently do even today. Right? We co create a lot of stuff with our community, and therefore, there's a lot of trust. Even if I stop my marketing today, I'm counting on my consumers or my community to fight for me for the next three months on social media, right? whatever goes wrong. Second part is the ecosystem. Uh, when you do build an ecosystem, uh, when, you do, when you do build trust, uh, for a category like VR, which is an EV category, a lot of things has to happen to address the barriers. So, you, I think before we walked into this room, we said, we spoke, you spoke about the charging uh, uh, 
issues that people have in the country. Today we are the brand which has put 1,400 fast charging uh, uh, grids across the country. And we, we are by far the largest by any brand in the country today, including uh, all brands tool has put together, we are, five, we are by, by far exceeding those targets. The third is the product, right? Without product, you can't build trust. I would be just tapping to say that uh, we built a good product unless the product doesn't deliver on product. Today, if you look at your mobile phones, the battery which is there probably fits at the 10%, you still have that anxiety whether I can consume the content for next 10 minutes before I reach a charging point. Today, what we offer in, a, in our scooter is uh, not just a commute device, but also an extension of the mobile phones. And the battery that we provide is actually provides the to, uh, assurance to the T. Example, say I show the battery percentage is 5% and I also indicate the kilometers you can travel with that. And that delivers to the T. You reach 5 kilometers, only then the, the battery drives. Right? And you don't end up on the road uh, without uh, having any charging grids. Uh, so that's how you build the trust. The second point is the education. Uh, even today, though the penetration of EV scooters among the uh, scooter buyers about 20%, right? that's fairly high. Uh, we are in an early majority stage as far as the technology adoption is concerned. Right? But still people are questioning about what does EV bring to me. Of course people know that it's a greener uh, scooter. Yeah, the total cost of ownership is uh, very, very less compared to an, uh, the normal combustion engine scooters. But it's not just a scooter that used to be uh, about five years or ten years back. Today, the EVs that are coming into market has, has got to do more with technology. Technology because we want to provide a different set of experience to a consumer. And therefore, it is not just an automobile, it's an extension of your mobile phone and an experience that we provide on the scooter. So, that actually forms a core part of our strategy when we look at uh, our uh, consumers, where we say that, okay, it, we are not providing a commute device from point A to point B, but we are talking about taking the tensions out of your mind. Uh, example, say every morning you get up, probably you may look at your mobile phone to see the traffic, but if, what if they, it is there on the, on, on the, on the uh, dashboard of the product itself. Uh, the third part is that how we built about the mobile strategy. Uh, it, it's been called to our strategy right from day number one that we started, even before we had the product. Right? All the community that we had, the conversion that we had was on our mobile phone. All the co-creation that we did and we do today is on the, on the mobile brand. A lot of things that we do as an experience is built into the mobile phones. Uh, we do today, we provide a, a mobile app. I think everybody in this room are aware of the acquisition channels. Uh, how do you nurture the leads and what do you do post uh, uh, acquisition of the customer? For us, post acquisition of the customer, the experience that we provide on the mobile mobile app is very, very important and it is very ingrained in the DNA that we, that we talk about every day. We are really obsessed about our consumers and that actually uh, is being uh, delivered on the ground through our mobile. Example, say today sitting here, I, I know where, what kind of battery percentage is on my scooter because I'm an app. How many kilometers can I travel? If I travel from here to Mysore, can I charge it on the way? So I can configure my route, where's the kind of uh, uh, the route that I take. Uh, I can also know how am I riding my scooter, whether I'm making uh, efficient utilization of my uh, ride battery, whether I'm riding it the right way. So a lot of technology is built into the, uh, into the app and therefore the entire experience of the scooter. Uh, the way we look at this category, uh, mobile happens to be the core of what we do today. But it, it's all about how we redefine the experience of a scooter for a consumer. So today, the kind of uh, expectation a consumer has towards scooter is going to be drastically different from what's going to be in the next five years, ten years. And actually, Aether is defining that one through all the mobile experiences that we do. Fantastic. I can't wait to see what you all are going to do in five years. Um, I had an experience actually once when we were, I was in a traffic, at a traffic light, and I could hear someone talking and having a full blown conversation. Uh, and I realized that he was talking to the bike. Um, because there was a call connected and there was a full-blown conversation and it, for, a, for a long time we were all wondering where were these voices coming from. So were we losing it or were we hearing it? Uh, but thank you for that. I think it's a very interesting <coughs> space. Like you said, you can have the product, but uh, I mean you, you can talk about the product, but you've got to deliver it. And when you do that, you've gained a user for life uh, and a customer who trusts your brand and kind of uh, works with you thereafter. Um, so continuing on trust, uh, Porter hai ho jayega, uh, Mohit. 
balancing perform um, performance marketing and brand building surely has its challenges and can also be an art if gotten right. Uh, my question to you, in this unique uh, consumer business uh, of Porter, how does the mobile first approach work to balance and use branding and the performing um, performance marketing? So you rightly said that, you know, uh, balancing the performance marketing and the brand marketing is a is a complex piece. I think it requires that fine balance. And uh, very honestly, I think this is one of the most debated topics within the team internally, at least at Porter. Uh, uh, and for the large part of our journey, till let's say 2021, we were always uh, organizing such a very <coughs> performance heavy. I mean, we used to think, hey, I mean, I mean, put something on the this side and. And I think in 2021 we uh, decided ki, okay, let's go ahead and invest a little on the brand side. And traditionally, I think, uh, and we are we are also guilty of it. The thinking has been that when you invest, I mean, in, investing in performance marketing is very different, and investing in brand marketing is very different. They probably don't meet with each other. But I think that thinking has evolved. So when we did our first brand campaign uh, last time. Uh, last year, I mean, which is delivery, and it was pretty successful one. I think what we realized in our performance ma marketing as well is that our CPCs were lower, our CACs were lower, we had, thanks to some of the agency partners, we were, we had implemented ADH inside, where we were able to see the data as in, uh, on how the brand marketing, or the investment in the, in that campaign is, Helping us in improving the performance part as well, and we saw, uh, good, and we saw some reasonably good results, I think. And it, and then we realized that, uh, you know, all of this while maybe we were not thinking it right. Uh, so, my my increasing sense is, and what we have started doing is that now everything that we consider, or uh, we are at least moving to that is all of the assets that you are putting out there, all of the conversation that you are putting out there, all of the content that you are putting out there, uh, is all should be passing through the lens of the brand. So the performance marketing team should not be just be thinking about, okay, I'll just get those thousands of customers, etc. and I'll not <coughs> care much about the brand. And similarly, the brand team should not be just thinking, I'll just move the brand. But I think they meet and in fact, all piece of communication is a reflection of your brand. And some of the companies that we really spoke about, does that extremely well. So that has been our uh, learning. And frankly, the realization is that I think this is, uh, and we are learning, that some of the best, biggest brands, like, I mean, uh, Fevicol, Asian Paints, all of them have been built over many, many years of constant investment on the brand. So it doesn't happen overnight. And I mean, if they just did performance, I'm not sure what would have happened. I mean, that's not even a possibility. But I think the stance that at least we have taken is that they go hand in hand. All of your assets need to pass through that brand. Line. And when you invest in both of them together, is essentially you should be able to move your most important metric, which is maybe the brand equity, which is you know which is influenced by familiarity, repeat the respect that you have in the market, uh, and and all of that. So um, in short, I think we're learning, but I think. Investing in both of them together till now have have yielded good results <coughs> for us, and I think uh, we plan to continue on that journey for the next couple of years. Fantastic! That's good to hear. I hope uh, other publishers are listening to that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think it is definitely a balancing act. Uh, brand recall being top of mind is important. Uh, because automatically if I'm looking at uh, a courier service or someone to move my goods, brands come to mind and if you are there, you get that conversion. So yes, it, it is an art. Um, thank you. Um, we are moving from a C to C kind of a format to a B to C to a B to B. Gokul, you have the best experience in this space and I think um, uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, you know, retaining uh, customers, and uh, this also, I, I would say, has a certain action and a dedication. Maybe a quest for excellence in a way. Now at uh, Razorpay, 
Um, so my question is, what benefits does this mobile first approach offer and how does it impact customer loyalty? Sure. I'll talk about from both the brands, right? Like, uh, uh, at Swiggy, I think 50% of the attention was influenced by the storefront. That being uh, how we list the restaurant, how the checkout and cart experience, all of that matters to a great extent how we look at uh, the retention and loyalty. But when it comes to a uh, recipe, uh, the, the people that we talk to, the people that we service, the end of users are business owners. These are CEOs, founders, co-founders and CTOs are the one who takes decisions on it, right? And uh, what matters to them is the technology that they run, the so payment has to run smoothly. That's what they care about. They don't really have to uh, figure out, and they have, and we have to be smooth enough so that the business runs properly, right? So a lot of the attention is being played on that in terms of how ease of integration, how uh, uh, security, how stress, this, the things, etc. Right? So, but when we deep, we're deeply went into the data and figure out how mobile first approach can really brings an opportunity to, uh, you know, amplify the retention piece. I think what we found is, for example. When, when users on board and when later when the uh, founder or a CTO want to look at on a daily basis or a weekly basis and insights, right? When we hosted that on the, our app, it, we find great results coming from an attention loyalty perspective, right? When they, they because the, the use case are very different. When you integrate or when you are onboarding, you don't really use mobile a lot. But uh, what what sort of use cases I can offer on mobile for a particular user? that differ from CEO to a finance guy to an account guy. It's a very different insights I can give, right? So a lot of insights, a lot of delight factor that we can put it on our app or on mobile, which is which serves as a retention loyalty for us versus rest of them are core or the core technology that we have, right? So I think one of the takeaway that we always add is like, look at what is the right experience that we can create irrespective of the devices that we are going on. And wherever uh, we can create a, uh, an experience on mobile, uh, be it, it, it a report, uh, one of the classic examples is also that we have a product called Payment Links, uh, which is an instantly you can create a link and share with anyone. The users of these are like tutors, who's a music teacher or a, be it a yoga teacher, right? These users does not have the time to kind of sit and figure out how do I create my whole payment system. They need convenience immediately. And so the whole Payment Links as a product has been built only on mobile versus Payment Gateway where there's a lot of time and effort required, a trust required that you need to build from a very de device perspective. There's no irrespective of devices you have to build it, right? So you're looking at what sort of product, what sort of use cases, what's the need of the user and building that uh, and take that to mobile is, is what matters to us and that helps a lot in our, especially on re retention. Some of these strategies helped us in retaining customers when it comes to B2B space. Fantastic. So uh, I think creating Knowing your use case and creating experiences matter. Uh, something I know, Aparna, that means a lot to you from an experience perspective. So here's, uh, you know, over to you on crafting a compelling mobile story for all the many brands and industries that you work with. How can brands effectively use mobile, plat uh, mobile platforms to enhance their brand strategies and attract new users? Considering challenges like shorter attention sp spans and the plethora of choice. Yeah, so a, a lot of it has been spoken, um, you know, by Mohit uh, and Google. But a specific point that caught my attention on what Mohit mentioned is about, um, you know, it's not do not look at you know mobile strategy from a performance angle itself, right? Um, it's very hard for agencies as well when you ex when you want to experiment when you recommend strategies. And obviously, right, owing to you know the the current um, landscape, also you need to measure your return on advertising spend, and therefore you're monitoring it very closely. But I think if you have to be future ready, your communication DG. I mean, he spoke about both sales and communication DG. Your communication DG today is going to be your sales DG in the next few years, right? And therefore, if you do not invest in um, you know your branding strategies, right? You cannot therefore um, you know uh, get your performance. Uh, you know, right, right. It's it's linked, especially on mobile. It is not like or a television. It is not like you know that you first doing a branding awareness and then your consideration and then your performance. It doesn't work like that. The context is very different, right? And therefore, um, I personally think that you should not look at branding and performance separately, right? It is completely intertwined, and you need to keep. Measuring
measuring, of course, right, and which allows you to do therefore data analytics is is a key. But I think don't look at uh, you know your strategies, you know, with respect to performance in isolation. But you need to also keep investing a lot in um, you know your communication, your messaging, your assets, right, and then look at how you're creating this awareness over a period. Um, I personally buy a lot on Instagram and I don't know about these brands before but I have discovered them on Instagram. It's not like I buy in the first shot that I meet them but I, I know I want, uh, I have, they have the product that I want, they have the color that I want and I like the material and I'm like, I know this is for specific categories but I'm saying it's a change in the mindset that's happening. So it's not necessary that you have to create a lot of awareness over a period of time to build concentration. Of course the category that Pranesh is in is very different so I can't, I'm not generalizing it. Right. Secondly, user understanding user journey is very important, right? Um, uh, which is why again I go back to analytics and data because uh, where is your consumer dropping out, right? Uh, what is it that they are, you know, repelling with your communication and messaging? What is it that they are not getting it? And hence, investing in your brand assets, right, is really really important, right? It could be anything. It could be your social media channel. It could be your microsites. It could your e-com, it could be your app, anything, right? But investing in your brand assets and understanding user journey is again very important, right? Um, while everybody spoke about performance, I'm not going to touch upon that because I think they will know it better than me. But I'm going to mention something which a lot of, uh, uh, which I, I have not heard uh, in this forum so far is visual storytelling, right? Uh, again, look at your modern, slightly younger consumer. Storytelling is important. Need to build your brand narratives for mobile, right? A lot of brand uh, marketeers, uh, 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 brand, uh, you know, brands. What they say is that I have a 60 seconds, so I'm able to tell the story, right? <coughs> I will try and do that in 30 seconds, but I'm compromising on my storytelling, right? It does not have to be necessarily a 60 second asset to, um, you know, tell your story. You can do it in many more interesting ways if you understand the user journey. For example. My discovery point could be a social media channel, right? I know I have few seconds and therefore Meta also spoke some time back about thumb stopping creatives but I have like you know few seconds to grab my consumer's attention. But if I'm tracking my consumer, I know I have to evolve on that narrative. Therefore, what other assets should I invest and build on to continue that na narrative? So that I think to me is a very powerful strategy that brands can use. In fact, my nobody takes social media posts so seriously. It's, it's become like a hygiene. I'm doing it because I have to be there. And therefore, my teams also, we have a dedicated social media team who's constantly making strategies on social media. And sometimes they say, it's not important to the client, right? Therefore, I'm putting something which is, you know, really doesn't matter. I don't even know if my consumer is seeing. But I tell them you're so wrong. Because that specific real estate on a social media is like your full page, um, you know, ad in a newspaper. Only difference is that you need to know the kind of narrative you need. In fact, there are immersive technologies also which can be used and made, you know, the, the social media post can be made, uh, you know, very interesting. And hence, which messaging at what stage of your user journey and therefore the context of the environment that you're in. So your social media, your, um, you know, your um, e-com, your app, your website, your brand assets, Everything needs to have a different messaging, different strategy, and that you can only do when you have user journey. Therefore, I think visual storytelling, to me, is a very, very important thing that brands need to crack, uh, because that's how you will take your nar brand narrative forward and across multiple formats and uh, you know channels. I think that, to me, is something that will be interesting to see in terms of agencies who crack it, nothing like it. Thanks, Aparna. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't say it better. Uh, I think thank you for really setting context uh, on being on the another side <coughs> of, of the table and being able to add to what publishers should be doing, what uh, brands should also be looking at. Because I think we all kind of uh, are partners in this journey. Publishers should play play a larger role in all this. No, I'm I'm serious because there are ideas, there are innovations, there are things. But then if if you are not, a lot of times we, you know, we want to do something, but if there are limitations in terms of what you can do from various challenges, right, that you have. I think a lot of innovation also needs to happen on the publisher side because I am discovering the brand there and therefore how I discovered, right, and what is the storytelling. I think more formats, more innovative formats, right, more interesting options for a consumer and brands to explore. I think that's a big responsibility. <laughs> I got myself into that. 
Um, okay, saving the best for last. Uh, I, I think we can all agree that data is the new gold. Um, how one uses it would either accelerate a brand forward or completely misunderstand the modern consumer, completely ruining it. Um, Prashant, uh, what in your experience has been the key matrix with a modern consumer to track uh, effectiveness of branding efforts and user acquisition? Thank you. Um, I guess I'm the last speaker standing between everyone here and lunch, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. So, so I'll keep it short and sweet, right? Um, so, just uh, prior to working with MoneyView, I, I'm just going to give you two perspectives into this because I was with Flipkart for five years prior to this. And uh, we looked at data a little differently there and currently at MoneyView, we look, uh, we look at data a little differently. Uh, but that does not undermine the criticality of how we use that data in the present day and age. Right? I think a common thread is that um, given that both the platforms that I work for, uh, uh, but that I've been a part of, they're both mobile first platforms, uh, you have a lot of information that you get. Right? Uh, you have a lot of apographic behavioral patterns, uh, you know, what sort of media they're consuming, so on and so forth. So you, as a brand, what you tend to do is that you rely a lot on the transactional data that you see to come up with a marketing strategy, uh, which is a little more transactional, I feel, uh, rather than also combining that with understanding what the psychographic profile of the consumer is. So I think that the apographic data that you get is extremely critical in understanding um, what are the actions that a consumer is taking before the actual purchase or before actually applying for a particular financial product in the two cases is. Um, but there is a lead up to that, right? And that is determined by a lot of, uh, you know, triggers, barriers, limiting beliefs, etc. So a lot of the data that we have on consumers should also be married to some sort of a, you know, research that you do uh, from, it could be an offline research, it could be an online research, but research plus data is something that is very critical at this point in time because the data that you have access to is pretty much the data that all your competition also has access to, right? So it's very critical for you to be able to read that data and decide how you want to segment your consumers and how you want to target them depending not just on their transactional behavior but also on their psychographic profile, which part of the country they are from, which life stage they are in, which, you know, what are their aspirations, what are their, uh, what are their barriers to adoption, so on and so forth. It worked both, uh, it works, uh, it's a very strong point both in e-commerce as well as currently in the fintech space as well. Um, now coming to the second part of your question, uh, which is how do you measure the effectiveness of the marketing campaigns that you do? So there's, there's no real simple answer to this, right? But, but I would say that as a brand, um, especially talking about MoneyView where, uh, you know, over the course of the past four or five years, uh, we have been growing predominantly on the back of performance marketing, right? I think the effectiveness of uh, overall marketing spends will uh, boil down to what is the level of uh, reliance that you have on paid marketing channels. Right. Uh, the more and more you rely on paid marketing channels, the more you're going to realize that you will hit an upper cap beyond which you cannot scale or beyond which you are not going to have something of a very different strategy as compared to your competition. So uh, for me, the core metric, and I'm not talking about brand or performance separately, but I'm talking as an overall organization, our core metric is to reduce our dependence on paid channels. Uh, the idea is to increase the percentage share of uh, transacting consumers, uh, visitors, etc., who are coming through your organic channels. Those organic channels could be, you know, your website. It could be uh, uh, coming organically to your Play Store. Uh, the number of followers that you have on social media, the level of engagement that you have on social media, the engagement rate, so on and so forth. So that for me is a very critical metric. Of course, when you look at it from a performance channel point of view, there are other, you know. Uh, hard-coded matrices, so as to speak, but but this should give you an overall health of your brand. If you are able to 
continuously reduce the percentage contribution of your business that's coming from paid channels. You know that at least you're heading in the right direction in terms of how you're positioning yourself for the consumer and how uh, how sticky your brand is in general. So yeah. Thank you. Um, I think being responsible with data is important. Yes. Um, uh, ideally, looking into it and kind of really custom making it as you need to build whatever objective you have yeah. uh, and across brands that will vary. Uh, that's important and I think a key takeaway that everyone needs to look at data but do it responsibly. Yeah. So yeah, uh, lunch time everyone. But before, I want to kind of work up a little appetite here. Uh, don't worry, this is a rapid fire end. Uh, so for Mohit, Aparna and Prashant, uh, what would be that one superpower you think necessary to engage this modern mobile first consumer? A-B testing, if I can A-B test everything on the floors, all my creatives, etc. I would love to develop. <laughs> I, I think I, I want a superpower to get into consumer's mind because uh, irrespective of how much data we have, I, I think a lot of time we don't know why a consumer is not resonating with a brand and a lot of unanswered questions that clients ask us and we don't have answers for that. So I really, I think, can do with some superpower with that. Uh, since you said superpower, I'm going to keep it outside the realm of reality, right? So uh, I think predictability is something that I would really like, do anything for, right? Because in the current day and age, you can't really put a pattern even for say six to eight months that because consumers are behaving in a certain way now, they're going to continue to behave a certain way even four or five months down the line. There are so, there's so much uh, external stimulus that's driving consumer behavior and their decision making that it's become highly unpredictable to be able to know exactly what is going to work and what is not going to work. So, so yeah, I think predictability is going to be uh, one superpower that I would uh, yearn for. Nice. Uh, Pranesh Rajikar and Gokul, what is your mantra as a marketer to stay agile with the evolving consumer and tech advancements? <coughs> a quick word of uh, advice that you see, would advise. See, for me, it is everything starts from customers. Yeah. I keep everything from customer first, customer centric, and that drives me sense of ownership, and that drives everything you meet, which is editing everything, right? So that, I think that's, that's the mantra that I always look forward. True that. Yeah, the mantra that I have is um, walk into any meeting thinking that you don't know anything, especially with people who are very close to consumers. And those people are our agency partners, the publishers, our FGD does discussion that we do with our consumers. As marketers, we need to be open to a lot many new ideas. And once you go with an open mind to learn, probably you'll pick up more than what you study in books. Great. That's it. So, um, so for me, um, I think in marketing, there are no big ideas. Right? They, ha they happen very rarely. So what you have is an idea, and you execute it to perfection and make it big. So it's not about idea, but the execution. So that's what I believe in. Nice. Thank you so much. Thank you, my panelists. It's been a pleasure. Uh, very insightful. I wish we had more time, but maybe we should continue this in a closed door uh, room. But uh, and thank you, E4M, for having us again. My audience, it's lunchtime. Uh, thank you for putting up questions. Yeah. Um, maybe outside you can catch them. Uh, people have got a flight to take, so we don't want to hold them on that. But thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Adil. Thanks for. Having me.